Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PTC News You Can Use. This is a special edition dedicated to A Christmas Carol, which opens today. Oh, an amazing collaboration between Penobscot Theatre Company, Ken Stack, and The Object Group. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to meet these fine citizens. First, we'll go over to my favorite woman on the planet, none other than the completely delightful Jen Shepard. Jen? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. And I'm, I'm here with Barry Newport, our producing artistic director. How are you, Barry? Hey, Jen. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Roy, too. Hey, thanks for coming on. Well, Roy wanted to meet you, but he just left the room. Uh, so we always like that. <laughs> I know you can never get him in the same room. Ugh, it's almost like we're the same person. <laughs> well, uh, tell me. So here we are opening a Christmas Carol in this right? uh, brave new world. Amazing. I, yeah. I mean, when I think about putting this season together, it seemed like so far away. And I remember <laughs> exactly where I was in August when I was like, I'm going to call. I'm going to call Ken Stack and I'm going to see if we can do a one man version of a Christmas carol. And then I remember where I was a couple of weeks later when I was like, okay, I don't think we can do a one man version of a Christmas carol between FB and the virus and everything else that's going on. So I'm going to call this guy that I've been just like totally artistically obsessed with for like way over a decade named Michael Haverty in Atlanta. And, and and let's see if we can do something. That seems like so long ago, but here we are. Here we are in December. Here we are. And speaking of Ken Stack, he's going to join us right now. <gasps> Come on, Ken. Hey, Ken. Oh, my gosh. It's hey, Ken. Stack. Happy holidays. Happy opening oh, to night. You too. To you, too. And congratulations. Oh, so here we are. This is like an opening night different than the other opening nights that you've had of A Christmas Carol, isn't it, Ken? You don't have to put on We've makeup. Never, no one's ever had opening nights like we are having <laughs> this year. It's amazing. But <laughs> the fact that we're having them is what's wonderful. Uh, Barry, really big thanks to you for putting all of this together. You <laughs> did a marvelous job of pulling us all into this wonderful, wonderful production again. Thank yeah, you. it's been um, it's been a really cool season in many regards, but mm -hmm. probably the most fulfilling has been being able to give as many artists as possible work, and um, yeah. we've brought all kinds of people into the fold, and that's been very very rewarding. I have a question for you though, Ken. When so this is your adaptation. When did you write this adaptation? Um, I believe it goes back to 1983, this particular version. And I will give some credit to um, uh, a fellow by the name of William Stansel, who used to work at the Actors Theatre of Louisville, who Ooh. did the first particular, what we call the factory version of A Christmas Carol, where everyone in a Victorian factory uh, has nowhere to go on Christmas Eve. So they tell each other the story of A Christmas Carol. Uh -huh. Well, that evolved into one that we did for the early years of Penobscot Theater, 1983. And then in the 90s, having done the show in different other versions for Penobscot and the Grand and Ellsworth and Acadia Rep and uh, uh, Wayside Theater in Virginia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I put the one person version because I needed to work. And so put together, I've done the show by then probably about 20 times. So I said, let's uh, just wow. do it all as a one person thing, get up there. And also everybody was doing one person Christmas carols. It was the year that Patrick Stewart had done his and it was the thing to do. Uh, and so I just jumped uh, on the bandwagon. And then when, uh, so I did that for a while in the nineties. And then it just kind of sat fallow until you called me up many, many years later and said, hey, how about doing this? And that's where we started. And we used that particular script as the jumping off voice for, point for uh, bringing in the, the object group to really bring it to life in a way that I had never even imagined was possible. And I was thrilled when I saw the completed production. It, it, the audiences have such a delight and such a treat ahead of it's amazing. 
just amazing. Yeah, Ken, it's interesting. This one was uh, a little different. Oh, sorry, no, Barry. Well, uh, this one's a bit different because the process, uh, you couldn't all be in the same room together. So how did you and Michael collaborate? We weren't even in the same state. <laughs> uh, and, uh, quite often, we weren't even in the same state of mind. But Michael <laughs> got us all on track absolutely brilliantly. Uh, the Penobscot Theater has a little recording booth up off of the balcony uh, in a storage area at the very top of the building. They built a really nice plastic enclosed, hermetically sealed, COVID-proof <laughs> recording studio where I sat there with a microphone and the script, and we taped the entire show. Send it to Michael, and Michael came back with, you know, it'd be a good idea if we tried this, if we tried that. And so we went back. And we re-recorded a lot of the voices, a lot of the narration, a lot of the sequences, and Michael would be listening. And we'd do you know, this particular sequence and say, hey, how about this? We'd go back, we'd tweak it again. And together, uh, I think we put together a, a, an audio product that I was thrilled to be able to do. And it was just yeah, so pretty much amazing. fun. And Michael's insights into the script and into how he was going to tell the story were absolutely vital. That really gave us a strong focus of where this is going to go. And when you see it together with the puppets and the, well, I won't, I won't take away from your interview with the object group. We'll let them blow their own horn as they deserve the right to do so. Okay. Uh, can you tell me something I thought was funny that you have to forget lines <laughs> yes, on the I've version. done so many different versions of A Christmas Carol, um, including the one-person version where you're doing tons of narration. And so every time I do a different version, it's a different director or uh, adapter's idea of where the flow of the story should go. So I have to remember, okay, in this production, I don't say this, but I do say that. And when Scrooge is becoming, oh, by the way, I don't want to give anything away, but Scrooge becomes very nice at the end. Yeah. <laughs> what? And has this Spoiler. massively long monologue about uh, how he gets happy. But some have the laugh. Some don't have the laugh. Some have this line. Some uh, don't have that line. Some have bed curtains. Some don't have bed curtains. And you have to remember, which show am I doing this time? And that's what a uh, massive rehearsal is for. But sometimes you're just in there with very little rehearsal and you've got to go with the flow. It's one of the joys though of being, of spending so much time with Dickens and A Christmas Carol is that the material is so rich, so beautiful, so much fun to revisit each year that it's always a delight, whichever version you're doing. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Barry, do you have any oh. other questions? Oh, well, I just wanted to, have? I mean, for people who may be new to Penobscot Theater Company, um, uh, so this is our 47th season, and Ken Stack mm -hmm. um, not only played Scrooge in at least 13 productions for Penobscot Theater Company, but Ken was also a, an artistic director of the company. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people may not know that Penobscot Theater Company um, was birthed out of Acadia Repertory Theater, of which Ken is uh, also a founding artistic director. Um, and um, Penobscot Theater Company really was the year-round version of Acadia Rep, which still, of course, <laughs> is um, the resident company of Acadia National Park. The, the object group, I mean, so many of these, these people that, um, are, I don't know if everyone's able to see them yet, but I certainly am, but, uh, Michael and Brian and, and Spencer, these are people that I've admired and totally, totally geeked out as an artist over for <laughs> many, many, many years. My parents have lived, have lived in Atlanta for over 20 years and I've been like an itinerant um, Atlantean. Um, and on so many of my uh, times in Atlanta, I've been able to see their work individually and their work from afar. And um, very rarely have I personally had the opportunity to work with them. Um, and so this is like a very magical moment uh, for me also because uh, we were able to not only use the incredible skills of, 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 of themselves as artists, but also this incredible work of Charles Dickens, which really I only fell in love with 
Um, my last time that I was in Atlanta, um, when I was at the Alliance Theater and finally saw a production of A Christmas Carol that I thought was truly, truly magical. And that's what I had oh. hoped to recreate in this um, mag magical marionette world, which I think Michael and the object group have totally accomplished. Absolutely. Well, Ken, congratulations. Barry, <laughs> congratulations. I think it's pretty cool that in the middle of, um, you know, like a worldwide emergency that we've been, um, that you all have been able to bring such creativity to problem solve and bring everybody a little piece of joy, which we all very much need. Excellent. Now I'm going to be joined by the object group. And that is Michael Haverty, Ray, Brian, Spencer, and Nicole. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hey. We're so happy to have you. First of all, congratulations on your opening night. Happy Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe let's go around one by one and let's tell everybody your name and what you did on the film. Let's start with Michael. I guess I told you. I'm also. <laughs> my name is Michael Haverty, and I was the director of the show. Um, I helped assemble the team here in Atlanta uh, that built and dressed and painted our puppets and then performed them in this film production. And it was amazing. It was a wow. wonderful experience, and we're so happy to share it. Yay! And how about Ray is next on my screen? My name is Ray Kaplan. I am one of the Two puppeteers who puppeteered the all of the marionettes and the flat figure puppets. Okay, great. And then Spencer. Hi, I'm Spencer Stevens. I'm the other puppeteer <laughs> that puppeteered the marionettes and flat flat figure puppets. Okay, and then uh, Brian. I'm Brian Mercer. I uh, composed the music and um, built it and played it, and sometimes puppeteer, sometimes composer. Cool. All right. And then Nicole. Hey, I'm Nicole Clockle. I made the costumes and dressed these little suckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those little suckers. Um, so, Michael, can you tell us how this process was different? You, you kind of talked to me about it a little bit, about <laughs> the way you had to work, you know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, sort of with the way the pandemic played out um, and this came right in the middle of it when everything was known. We, we, uh, we just had to take real care of our studio environment. Um, and also we had to find a lot of people who we trusted uh, to work with that we knew could bring in the level of professionalism and, and knowledge that would get us ahead of the game. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I was lucky enough to assemble this great team. Everybody joined on and, um, and so it was a remarkable speed and w in which we worked and also uh without ever really seeing anyone in person for any of it right. um so, which is very i've never worked like that before <laughs> i like to meet with the person i like to see the puppets you know in person as they're being built but the way this worked we uh we had our designer uh uh sam carter send the designs to our fabricator russ vick who fabricated the heads and the hands out of some 3d printers and then from there they went to a painter, Rachel de Uriost. Uh, and from there they went to Nicole, who costumed them. And from there they came to me and I put the controls on them. And so it was this just amazing factory line that just wow. worked to a T. And I'm just so proud of everybody along the line because it was everything came out more than I uh, than I had hoped it could be. So it was amazing. And then the two of our puppeteers and I filmed for we rehearsed for about a week and then we filmed for about a week. Um, and actually Brian was there too. He was our warm up coach. So we would do warm ups with Brian virtually. He was on a little laptop computer <laughs> in our studio. So we would warm ups with him and then he'd leave and we would we block the show and, and film it. it. It was wild. I'm sure everybody's wow, got stories about this, uh, this experience in the company. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was gonna ask Ray and Spencer um, what was that like? Were you the only, were you two together filming or were, did you have to film separately as well or? No, we were all together. Um, it's okay. kind of, I think in 
you'll see in the way that it's filmed, it's the puppets that we used, we had to be all together. It would not have worked splicing it in. <laughs> uh, but we were, we were very careful and conscientious. We were masked the whole time and we were, um, Michael's created this little magical workshop out of his garage. And so we were in there filming and, every day. And Ray and I have worked together before. So like being in close proximity was fine with us, but you know, uh, making sure that we took care of all the protocols and just being, you know, as safe as possible, but still being able to be able to be together and have the puppets connect just really made it a lot more magical. Right. And and so, uh, Nicole, did the, the puppets like were shipped to you? So you get like this box of magic? <laughs> uh, we did sort of a, a relay race type of thing, like Michael was saying. So someone would build it and then they all get dropped off at another place and then someone paints it and then they all get dropped off here and I put the clothes on and it's very uh, like touch and go here. <laughs> that must it's be weird to not be in contact with that. people. Yeah, right, very exactly, much so. Exactly. But you know, Nicole had done some work with puppets and some work with the Christmas Carol, so it was like, ah, she knows exactly what she's doing. And even Brian, as a composer, he's composed for pop shows a lot, so he knows what we need. Uh, and then these two know they're going to come in and bring their their talents, Ray and Spencer, their idiosyncrasies and abilities to play, and that gives us a whole nother, uh, you know, toy chest to play with. Yeah. We were blessed. Speaking of the music, Brian, I love the way you describe the music. Uh, <laughs> as I told you, I can't wait to meet the man who brings Tom Waits to a Christmas carol. Not to mention Danny Elfman and Kurt Vile. I mean, come on, dude. So tell me about that process. Why did you pick those three inspirations? Uh, well, I know Michael pretty well, um, <laughs> frighteningly well, <laughs> and I know oh, he loves yeah. to uh, break these boundaries of expectations, and um, I know the show real well. I've performed in seven different ones. I've done the show with drag queens. I've done the show uh, with three people, and so knowing it helped a lot, but um, I, it's an odd process. Sometimes I come in after everything's blocked and play along. Um, this was the reverse. We had Ken's words narration, and then I laid in the music, and they fit it to us, which means, uh, especially on a piece like this, I think the words come first, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, my job is not to be noticed. I don't think it, a good score you should not hear, you should mm -hmm. feel, you know, mm -hmm. so it was mainly just yep. to support the tone and the energy. So every ghost, um, every stave had to be a little bit different and progress. So I started with Tom Waits in the bass line and then progressed into a funkier Kurt Vile with woodwinds and then ended up with a little bit of Danny Elfman because you got to pull all the stops out once you get to the ghost of future, you know, it's, yeah. and it's a long build, even at an hour. It's a incredibly, um, incredible pace. <laughs> um, I yeah. don't care for sentimentality, so I tried to avoid it at all costs. But this show demands a certain... I don't know, a certain mood, a certain tone. Um, and I think it comes from the honesty and the brilliance of the language and the absolute um, uh, genius of Ken. And um, I would just listen to his words and play along on keyboard first and match the timing mm -hmm. and then orchestrate around that and just keep on building. So I had a blast. Wow. It's just um, about what, 38 pieces? Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, about 40. Yeah. About 40. Yeah, pieces, it was it was just a joy. Yeah. yeah, I tried to push it further than um, and then you can't be weird for just weird sake. You know, like I said, right. it has to <laughs> it has to match the truth. So um, and I think we all kind of found it mm -hmm. in our own vacuums and then put it together. <laughs> I think that's what's amazing is that it does feel that that you all were in the same room and to find out that for the most part you weren't is really inspiring and that I, I think that probably speaks to all of your listening skills and maybe also the strength of the of the text um that's my yeah I, I think know. like i think a lot of the that strength came from barry at the very beginning and she had some very specific but few simple ideas that she wanted to make sure were there 
and that's where we connected. I mean, and that's why we chose to do it is because I was like, oh, yeah, that's how you should do Christmas Carol. Let's do this. Uh, and so having that sort of thematic or mood uh, taken care of in at least my brain and then everyone else was able to play along, that made this whole process really, really easy. I brought along some um, of the puppets we, if you want me to show. I was just going to say, can we meet some puppets, please? <laughs> well, I had to bring the star of the show. He wouldn't let anybody else. Typical. This is Scrooge's puppet. <laughs> Typical. And I'll go back here so you can see. Scene stealer. He's got a control right here. So he's a rod marionette. It means he's got a rod in his head, but everything else is strings. He's even got a little hmm. pair of keys here, a little prop from the show. But this type of puppet, most marionettes are very flowy and they dance really well because they're all on strings. But when you have a rod on it like this, it makes them kind of ridiculous and like lets them do things a little more fast and be a little more upset. Ooh, his head came off. He's really upset. <laughs> yeah. well, his head, he he's so bad his head he popped off. <laughs> it didn't happen at one string. Did you hear it happen here? But he's giving away his trick, which is that it actually his mouth comes off. And so we could put on different mouths during the show that gave him different emotions. And his uh, eyebrows also can be moved. So because oh, it was too. a film, we were able to go back and forth and just give him even more, uh, even more range. And so Ray, you actually operated Scrooge. I did. Right? I did. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. A female Scrooge. He was a lot of fun. What's that? A female Scrooge. Well, typecasting, maybe. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it really, a lot of it was just that. Like, when is Ray going to get to play Scrooge? There are not enough, like, female Scrooge. There are. Out. And so I was like, Ray is one of my That's favorite because you can, people. You can cast against type so Scrooge. easily. And it's usually done mm -hmm. because, you know, in theater, you can find human beings, but if you need like an onion to sing a song, you're gonna probably make a puppet. So yeah. <laughs> anyone can do that. I I hope this is the next project because I'm in. I want to see. <laughs> yeah, we we've been several different non-traditional characters because I've oh, been yeah. a, I've been a potato. I've been a turkey sandwich. You were a great potato. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh, it's that's true. what's so cool about this <laughs> um, and, and Michael you sort of I didn't know this there's a huge uh, puppet film world in Atlanta you kind of hit me to that yeah right it's a confluence of yeah. two industries that have always been pretty big in Atlanta which is the film community and the puppetry community uh, the largest puppet theater in the United States is here in Atlanta, the Center for Puppetry Arts, uh, and the Object Group. So we got a few games going in theater, and uh, and then our designer Sam Carter and our fabricator Russ Vick work a lot in the film industry here. Sometimes doing special effects, doing casting, molding, mm -hmm. illustration, or puppets, uh, and they both make their own mm -hmm. films as well. So there's the yeah, there's a whole bunch of puppet weirdos in Atlanta that sort of intersected with the Center for Puppetry Arts and then went out and, and did more. Uh, so, and the film industry is just going crazy here recently. So uh, having all these these people that we could get involved who knew what they were doing was amazing. These are some of the- So Nicole, the you, other... oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. And then I'll- Okay, I'll just show you this little bit, the, uh, the paper puppets. So Sam also, um, <coughs> illustrated these and then we made little uh, mechs on them that allowed them to uh, come to life. So this is like an old paper toy theater style, um, originally in England. But we had decided to do the entire spirit cast sequence in those paper puppets. That's so cool. And Nicole, have you costume puppets before? Or do you usually do puppets or people? I, uh, I costume people more often, but there is no often right now, I guess. Uh, I have costume puppets before at the Center for Puppetry Arts, and uh, it's a fun challenge because you know how people are shaped, basically. Like, I know, oh, if I'm going to make a shirt, I need these pieces, and it's generally going to be like a, 
you know, this kind of shape. But then you get somebody like, you know, a, a puppet whose hand is this big, but their arm's this skinny. And so it's a lot of, like, unexpected hand sewing because <laughs> you can't, like, close your fist to get your arm through a sleeve like you would a person. So you have to, like, make it around the arm and then stitch it up there. You know, things like that. Or maybe you're, okay. maybe the, uh, oh, what's his name? Old Joe. He's, he's like, this Old Joe. around yeah. in, in the belly, but then his legs are this tiny. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't find that very often. In yeah. <laughs> so they were wearing like couture creations is what I'm hearing yes. from you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fine. They and each have Brian, their own table. Have you, have you done a lot of, um, music for other films of puppets? Is that a thing that you're very familiar with? Oh, yeah. Um, but I usually have to write with um, a lot of uh, John Ludwig shows. I had to use like scientific information and write tunes about the digestive system and, the, you know, <laughs> and all this um, educational stuff. So it's nice to do something uh, uh, like a nice Victorian classic and something like this. But no, I do a, a lot of composition. Um, Michael and I have done plenty of shows for the High Museum in Atlanta, and um, mm -hmm. which range from writing songs about furniture and paintings and a little bit of everything. I don't write lyrics, I just write the tunes. And um, Michael's just a breeze to work with. You know, I think we changed, oh. I don't know, Michael, you, we changed maybe two little tunes. And um, for I work Carol? fast. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah just a little, he just gave me all the tunes tweets. and I had like one note. Yeah, yeah. It was an absolute dream to Everybody work with the, the entire process. Cool, well, it certainly was. And thank you all for joining me and being a guest here. And thank you for this beautiful gift that you have given us during this holiday season. Now we are going to uh, go to the film the making of a Christmas Carol. So good night, everybody, and enjoy the video. Stick around. Hey, everybody, I'm Michael Haverty, the director of A Christmas Carol. And um, when Barry approached me about this project, I said yes, because I've always felt a kinship of the weird with Barry. Um, and two, what a blessing to be offered a commission during a pandemic. <laughs> and three, the story. Uh, most of my work has been adapting classic literature to the puppet stage. And I find great joy in transferring characters from the page to visual, physical creations on stage. So. Um, I was really excited to take control of all of the wonderful characters and moments that are in A Christmas Carol. Uh, our team that we've assembled for this project, uh, along with and Spencer, we have Brian Mercer, um, who has over 40 years of experience in composition and performance. I hope audiences will take away a fresh understanding of this classic. We know the story so well and we've seen it in so many different ways. And hopefully this is a new way uh, and a refreshing tale and maybe learn uh, something we've never heard before, never seen before, never experienced before. Isn't that what we always want? Our two puppeteers are consummate pros who hit the ground running with their understanding of manipulation. Hi, I'm Spencer Stevens. And I'm Ray Kaplan. We're the puppeteers for A Christmas Carol. Um, puppets and sets were designed by Sam Carter. I would say that a big source of inspiration for me is uh, is Wayne White. I'm a big fan of his design style and I, I love his, his puppets, the stuff that he did from Pee Wee's Playhouse and beyond that. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of Ralph Bakshi and of uh, John Crick Falusi. I was kind of raised watching Ren and Stimpy. And, uh, and then uh, Henry Selleck, the work that he's done with, with Tim Burton, and then you know beyond uh, the work that he's done with Tim Burton, I'm, I'm a huge stop motion animation fan. A lot of the, the puppets that I have up on my shelves behind me are, are stop motion puppets. And, um, and I think you, know, you can really see 
the the marriage of that Tim Burton aesthetic, that you know German expressionistic uh, style, mixed with with Wayne White in the designs for a Christmas Carol. I think that uh, there's a bridge there that's that's fairly obvious if you're uh, familiar with with those two those two artists and their sensibilities. With puppets fabricated by Russ Vick on a 3D printer. Uh, this is that Marley head design you sent me, Michael. I just kind of wanted to quickly rough it out and ZBrush just to show you what it might look like in three dimensions. Um, there's no detail and I, I didn't have a profile so I just sort of guessed there, but I think overall it'll move much quicker uh, sculpting these out in ZBrush, printing them overnight, and then all that's left is clean up uh, assembly and paint. So yeah, I have Scrooge here with just a coat of gesso just so you can kind of see it uh, a little better. Um, removable mouth here. Just have a little screw which attaches to the magnet there. Um, I've got these interchangeable mouths. Yeah, I'm happy for a size reference regarding Christmas present. Big guy. Um, here's his hand <laughs> uh, and head with same thing, two interchangeable mouths. Whew. And then uh, Bob Cratchit with uh, his eyelids to close his eyes. Uh, there. Spirit uh, past? Is that right? Yeah. Tall, lanky one. <laughs> Not the skeleton. Uh, uh, yeah. And Spirit future here. Uh, more Reaper-like, and his hands are printing currently over there. They're a little bit bigger, not quite as big as uh, Spirit present. And puppets and sets painted by Rachel DeUriost. The puppet costumes were built by Nicole Clockle, who I first met years ago when she took my puppetry course at Kennesaw State University. So we have an enormous team working on all of the pieces you see in our show. What I hope that an audience takes away from this version of A Christmas Carol is the the humor and some of the uh, the, the silliness that uh, that is that's in that story and that is is possible in telling that story. Um, I think we've all seen very serious, dramatic versions of A Christmas Carol, and you know Marley's monologue about mankind was my business. And I think that if, if anything, I would hope that audiences would would see the humor in in the story and in the the way that uh, that Michael is is telling the story